We would like to start our show by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Sunemo people, with a broadcasting range that overlaps the Cowitzin and Slayaman territory. This acknowledgement is done with gratitude to the Sunemo people and with the intention to increase awareness about truth and reconciliation processes and efforts on Vancouver Island. Additional information and resources surrounding Sunemo history, reconciliation, protocol, and land acknowledgements can be found on our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages. Good afternoon and welcome to a new season of A Sound Constitution, a show where we focus on health topics important to our community. This year's team is made up of five third-year VIU nursing students with a goal to demystify health issues and address common misconceptions by sharing evidence-informed information from a variety of reliable resources. All information provided on our show will be available in our show notes on our Facebook and Instagram pages. We want to remind our listeners that the information presented in this show is for educational purposes only and does not replace the advice of your primary healthcare professional. If you have any questions or concerns about what's being discussed, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook at A Sound Constitution, Instagram at C-H-L-Y, A Sound Constitution, all one word, or email us at a soundconstitution at gmail.com. My name is Dana, and I'm one of the new hosts for this season and facilitator for today's roundtable. Today I have joining me my teammates and co-hosts, Cam, Taylor, Haven, and Amanda. On today's episode, we thought we'd talk about what we're studying to be. Nurses. Right now, nurses seem to be all the rage in the news, though much of what's being talked about seems pretty dire. There's a lot of articles about violence nurses are facing on the job, the ongoing burnout, and the ever-increasing nursing shortage. And while we're going to talk about these concerns, we also want to shine a light on what makes nurses and nursing in Canada something we want to be part of. To start off, we're going to spend some time giving our listeners a chance to get to know us as hosts. Each of us is going to talk a bit about who we are, why we wanted to come to nursing school, what we plan to do with nursing, and how we see the role of nurses in the future. So without further ado, I'm going to start off the roundtable with Cam. Hi, Cam. Thank you, Dana, and hello, everyone. My name is Cameron. I was born and raised in Nanaimo, and I now live a couple blocks away from my childhood home. And you know, funny enough, my new home is located in an area that was all industrial grounds and where I would walk my childhood dog. So I guess you could say I'm a homebody and have seen some developmental change in Nanaimo over the years. Going back to my childhood, I originally had no clue what I wanted to do when I grew up. I had always been intrigued by the medical field and, like many, assumed the way into medicine was completing a degree in science. And so, with that assumption, I started to begin a degree towards biology at the University of Victoria. Within two months of the start of my degree, I realized it was not for me and nursing was where I wanted to be. That following September, I moved back home to Nanaimo and started the nursing program at Vancouver Island University. Now in my third year, I am working on a perinatal specialty. For as long as I can remember, sexual health, women's health, and the pregnancy process has fascinated me. Entering nursing school, I knew I wanted to work in the delivery room with laboring mums and new babes. In my second year, I got a taste of that dream and had the opportunity to shadow and support the nurse during a birth. The feeling of holding that newborn and being one of the first people to hold him was surreal and something I will never forget. I still get chills to this day and right now as I tell you the story. I love supporting women and uplifting one another. It is astonishing the power, strength, and determination women go through during labor, childbirth, and the postpartum period. An area of passion that nursing school has sparked for me is neonatal care. I never thought I would want to work with preterm infants, and I think it is fair to assume many people would think of neonatal intensive care nursing as one of the saddest places to work. But for me, the idea of providing care and support to the neonate and family during this time in their life is inspiring and would be an honor to work for our most vulnerable population. With that being said, my goal is to continue on to NICU nursing as my career unfolds. To me, nursing is all about empowerment, support, and empathy. I see the role of the nurse as imperative to the healthcare system, as nursing is the connection between patient and the system itself. I'm excited to see how the role of the nurse evolves throughout my career while maintaining these core concepts. Having lived in Nanaimo my whole life, I was intrigued at the possibility of joining a sound constitution as my practice placement because I wanted to learn more about our community and how I can give back to the place that raised me. I also love learning and value communication. 
A sound constitution gives me the opportunity to work with professionals within the community to enhance our overall health and well-being. I'm looking forward to expanding my knowledge about resources within our community, and I'm excited to spearhead some conversations based on personal injury and women's health in the next couple of months. In my spare time, you would find me walking my golden retriever, at the gym, or cooking. To end my little introduction, a fun fact about me is that I was a bartender for many years and can mix up a mean cocktail. That's really interesting you were a bartender prior to school. At face value, it may not look that there's much similarities between nursing and bartending, but if I think about my own history and customer service positions, you really learn some of those core skills when you work with the public. It leads to experience in effective communication, conflict resolution, and really how to cope and adjust to the unexpected when it strikes. All that relates really well to the therapeutic relationship skills we hone as nurses. For sure. It definitely prepares you for the unexpected. So I'm looking forward to see how my career unfolds over the next couple of years. Thanks, Cam. And next up, we have Taylor. Thanks, Dana, for the wonderful intro <laughs> earlier in the episode. Um, so yeah, my name's Taylor, and um, I'm obviously a third-year nursing student at VIU, just like the rest of us. And I will be one of the hosts here on A Sound Constitution for the next two seasons, which I'm extremely thrilled about. A little about me, I was born and raised on Vancouver Island. I've basically lived here my whole life, besides like a two-year stint in Nova Scotia when I was really young, but I barely remember it. So I feel really fortunate to be living in such a beautiful place. I love the outdoors, so I find that Vancouver Island has a lot to offer in that respect. I love animals. I currently have two dogs, although I'd probably have five if I could and if I had the space and the time for it, but it's probably not the best idea as a nursing student, but maybe in the future. In my free time, I enjoy kayaking, reading, cleaning, which isn't a lie. I actually find it quite therapeutic. I also enjoy camping, and I try to get out to camp as much as I can during the sunny months and sometimes during the rainy ones, too. A little bit about my background in healthcare. I took the healthcare aid program back in 2010, which sort of introduced me into working in healthcare and eventually led me to my decision to apply for the nursing program. As a care aide, I worked mostly in the community doing home care, which I really enjoyed because I like seeing people in their homes. I feel like they're more comfortable there and that environment allows for good therapeutic relationship building. I also believe that it's hugely important to provide people the care and support that allows them to stay in their homes. For this reason, when I applied for the nursing program, I always imagined myself working as a home community care nurse um, after I graduate. But I've had also had some great experiences in other areas of nursing during my education, so I don't really know where I will end up. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I have a quite a few areas that interest me, including mental health, palliative, and dialysis. So I still have some decisions to make about what path I choose, but I'm not really in a rush right now. I'm just trying to get through nursing school at this point. I just hope that whatever path I choose, I can have a positive impact wherever I am. I chose to work on a sound constitution because being on the radio is not something I've ever done before. So I thought it'd be a good experience to kind of push me out of my comfort zone a bit and allow me to experience something that I might not ever have the chance to do again. I also like the idea of being able to identify needs within our community and address them and hopefully be able to provide some helpful information to our community and promote the health of our community as a whole. I also enjoy working closely with my group members here and being able to collaborate and see the different points of view and learn about their experience. So I think this placement really does offer a lot and I'm eager to get creative and begin to put together more episodes. What led you to like want to try other places besides going back as a community health nurse? Was it just doing your placements in acute care? I think it was mostly because I've done home care as a care aide. So that was sort of my comfort zone that I wanted to stick with it. And then each placement I went to, I was like, no, I want to be a community nurse. But then I'd have like a good experience at that placement and be like, well, I actually could maybe be this, you know, like, and it sort of opened me up. Um, a little bit to like other areas of nursing. So I just think I should try sort of a variety of things before I set my heart on on something. And you know, you can always change, right? There, you can, there's so much you can do as a nurse. So the beauty you, of nursing. Yeah, totally. And I, I 100% agree with you. It's like you have this one idea going into school, and then you get your toes wet in a little different places. And you realize you like it and you could work anywhere and everywhere. So yeah. nursing's a fantastic job just for that. You can go anywhere in Canada and work and you'll have fun. Yeah, I agree. 
You make a really good point, Cam, and I feel part of the reason students are less sure of what they want to do in nursing as they go through the program is because there isn't a lot of public discussion about where nurses work. We tend to think of nurses in places like long-term care, hospitals, and public health, yet nurses are found in numerous fields outside of healthcare. In British Columbia, we have a chief nursing officer, and the federal government is also creating a chief nursing officer position. There are nurses that work for international organizations like the United Nations and World Health, and there's lots of nurses in business that focus on governmental policy and advocacy. Then there is the growing field of nursing informatics. Informatics is the practice of integrating nursing information and knowledge with technology. I honestly believe we'll see that type of nursing work increase as technology and healthcare become further meshed together. You'll also find nurses in other spheres like occupational health and safety, insurance companies, and even cruise ships. Yeah, totally. I think a lot of people do sort of think of nurses as being associated with the hospital, but it, there's just so like such a field outside the hospital too that you'll find them. Nursing school is just a stepping stone into a whole world of choices that you don't even know about until yeah. you're told. Like it's crazy, yeah. really. It's a little overwhelming. <laughs> I actually agree with that. I find like it's very overwhelming to decide what you want to do because we have so many options. I'm still struggling with the what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, I want to be a nurse, but what do I want to do? I don't know. (laughs) Fair enough. And with that, we're just going to take a short break. Did you know that nursing was rated as the most trusted profession once again in 2021? According to the Gallup Poll's Honesty and Ethics of Professions ranking, nurses were ranked first for 20 years straight, beating medical doctors in second place by 14%. Did you know that there are four nursing designations in British Columbia? There's the registered nurse, the registered psychiatric nurse, the licensed practical nurse, and the nurse practitioner. Welcome back to A Sound Constitution here on CHLY 101.7 FM. If you're just joining us now, we're having a round table between us hosts, just chatting about our pathways to nursing and taking an opportunity for people to get to know us. And so with that, Haben, you're up next. Hey guys, I'm Haben and I'm one of the new hosts here on A Sound Constitution. And I'm super excited to be exploring health topics with everyone. To share a little bit about myself, I was born in South Korea and moved to Canada when I was in grade three with my family, which means all of my relatives are still back in Korea, so I miss them greatly. But I do love it here on the island as well, although I haven't seen a whole lot of it since I'm an indoor person. I love staying at home or doing activities that don't really involve a lot of exercise. So right now, I'm really into making different music playlists according to my mood. It really helps me relax, and music just really speaks out to me. However, my hobbies change constantly, ranging from something artistic to musical or literally just watching shows on Netflix. I always go through these phases of interest, and I get just stuck on one topic, and my whole world revolves around that subject until something else sparks my interest, and then I move on to the next thing. So that kind of ties into why I wanted to go into nursing. The fact that the nursing profession has so many different specialties and areas to work at, that just really intrigued me into going into this career path. Of course, the medical field was always interesting, and biology was my favorite science subject in high school, and I've always wanted to help others. But knowing myself, I probably will benefit from working in different areas of nursing in the future. You see, every placement that I've been to so far has been really interesting to me, and so I haven't been able to choose an area of specialty yet. So, what my plan is for now is to work at a medical and surgical unit first, and then go from there. The reasoning behind um, choosing a sound constitution for my community placement was because of the whole idea of producing something beneficial that is available for anyone to access. Also, I wanted to challenge myself. Public speaking is not my forte, but I wanted to become more comfortable with it, And so, here I am. Additionally, the production of it all interested me as well. As we live in a very techie world, the media is becoming more prominent in our lives, 
so I wanted to learn more about it. Thanks, Haben. And next up, we have Amanda. My name's Amanda, and I am one of the many hosts of A Sound Constitution for the next two seasons. So I was actually born and raised in Ontario, and about nine years ago, I moved to the island with my boyfriend and his family. My history in healthcare now includes some work at the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. I worked in a program for tobacco cessation. When I moved to the island, I enrolled in the community support worker program where I became certified as a mental health worker, an education assistant, and a personal support worker. And since graduating from the community support worker program in 2015, I've been working as a mental health support worker for a nonprofit, um, and I did that for about seven years. One of the reasons why I decided to go into nursing was because I found as a mental health support worker in the role I was working, it was really challenging for me to accept the limitations of my role. And I felt that nursing provided me more opportunities, not only to grow as an individual at the beginning of her career, but also it gave me more autonomy in, in how I want to work with clients. And so that's something I really value about nursing. I chose to work on a sound constitution because I wanted to push myself out of my comfort zone. As I get older, I find I don't love public speaking so much. I feel very passionate about providing information that's fact-based to the community so they can make their own informed decisions. So that really drove me to sign up for a sound constitution. And so here I am today. Thanks, Amanda. And I guess that just leaves me to do an introduction. So I grew up here on the island. Like the stories of many of my teammates, I knew I wanted to work in healthcare, but I wasn't actually really sure where. Growing up, we don't really talk about nurses and nurses aren't really seen on TV. So I thought I had to be a doctor if I was going to affect change in my community. I started a degree at 17 in microbiology and biochemistry when I realized that though I loved science, I was not prepared to go to school for 12 years. I was also really lucky that a physician that I knew allowed me to shadow him for a bit at the hospital, and when I saw a glimpse of his day, I just realized that it wasn't what I wanted to pursue. So I ended up leaving university and felt adrift for a few years, and I worked all sorts of jobs in the service and hospitality industries. During that time, I actually got really sick, and I spent some time in the hospital. Over that time, I really got to know my nurses and I saw what they were doing and how much they meant to me in getting healthy again. And I realized that's what I wanted to do with my life. So when I got better, I went back to school and I became an LPN, not a licensed practical nurse. I've been an LPN now for just over 10 years. In that time, I've worked both here on the island and the interior. My main focus has been psychiatric inpatient, but I've also spent a few years working as a perioperative nurse, meaning I worked in the OR. When I moved back to the island a couple of years ago, I moved over to medical and surgical nursing. And kind of like how we talked about earlier, you can really move around in the nursing profession and find what works for you. I decided to come back for my RN because I wanted to move forward with my career and focus on national and international policy and nursing advocacy. Over the last year especially, I've had opportunity to attend the International Council of Nurses 2021 Congress. The ICN Congress is a chance for nurses to share their work, their advocacy, and their research. I had a chance to see how nurses are affecting real change all over the globe, and it just made me really proud that I get to be part of this profession. When it comes to a sound constitution, I wanted this experience because it's really in line with my personal hobbies. I do videography for fun, and this year I started taking my practice in photography a lot more serious. A sound constitution felt like a natural fit to expand and work on all my skills. Outside of my nursing life, I love hiking and overlanding in my Jeep. So far, I've crossed off 26 national parks within Canada and the US, and this year I have plans to cross off another 10 as well. And that's me in a nutshell, and that's our introductions. Thank you so much to my co-hosts for sharing some stories about yourself and getting a chance for our listeners to get to know you. Coming up next, we're going to share a video from the Johnson & Johnson's Nurses Change Lives campaign. We hope you enjoy it. During the Crimean War, more soldiers died from infection than in battle. Until a nurse, introduced
introduce sanitary practices still in use today. When the scourge of polio hit the world, it was standard practice to strap down and immobilize patients. Until a nurse discovered that movement and physical therapy had far better results. In the 1950s, jaundice was a leading cause of infant death. Until a nurse found that a few hours of sunlight could actually cure the condition. At the dawn of the AIDS epidemic, no one knew how the disease spread. So patients were kept quarantined and alone. Until nurses defied convention and embraced them with compassion. During the Ebola outbreak, the disease was thought by many to be too contagious to treat. Until a student nurse used what she had on hand, garbage bags and duct tape, to protect herself so she could care for others. And cerebral palsy robbed many patients of their ability to speak, until a nurse gave them back their voices. And I will always be grateful to her. We'd like to recognize the nurses mentioned in that video that include Elizabeth Kenny, Jean Ward, Fatu Kikula, Rebecca Kozolinski, and probably the most famous nurse, Florence Nightingale. So what are your guys' thoughts? Honestly, it's really inspiring to see what they talked about in that video and how we practice all of that today, every day. So it, it's kind of inspiring to think about what we might come up with in our time as a nurse and what they might continue to do throughout the future in nursing. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that video, like I think they showed it to us in first year or what, or something. And there's a few of them too, I found on YouTube, that's like the Johnson Johnson around that like same campaign. And it's like called the nurse effect. And it has like patients talking about their experiences and they meet up with like the nurse again. And like, yeah, it's like pretty heart, like heartwarming. <laughs> I really appreciated the one story they told about Fatu Kekula. At the time of the Ebola outbreak in Liberia, Fatu was a nursing student when her family got sick. Unable to access the hospital, she used trash bags and duct tape to cover herself while she cared for her family. Not only did three of her family members survive the epidemic, she herself didn't even contract the virus. Her ingenuity led to international organizations teaching the trash bag methods to other people in West Africa who did not have the means or the ability to make it to the hospital. You know, if there's one thing I have learned through the years, it is that nurses can literally MacGyver anything to make it work for their patients. Yeah, I just think that we work in these positions where we kind of have to be creative and just very strategic about how we deal with certain situations and you just never really know what to expect going into a shift every shift's different and so yeah you do get into these situations where you're kind of macgyvering everything just to get through the shift yep you become a really quick thinker on the job a quick and a critical thinker that's for sure yes mm -hmm. The next video we want to share is from the Canadian Nurses Association as part of their We Answer the Call campaign. The CNA is a professional advocacy body for all nurses in Canada. Not only do they focus on advocating for the advancement of the nursing profession, but also address national and international health initiatives that are important to nurses across the globe. Our feet walk hospital hall linoleum, long-term care carpeting, six-floor walk-ups, and safe injection site pavement. Our hands do the needle work, blood work, the wound work, the day and night work, the out-of-sight work. Our minds do constant calculations, split-second decisions, critical thinking, life and death problem solving. To us, being on call isn't a job description. It's a state of mind. We're face to face with the vulnerable, the healing, the dying, the newborn. We navigate the system, we jump over the cracks. We look from sick care to health care to a new culture of health, not just patient to patient, but neighborhood to neighborhood, nation to nation. Because our health is global. 
So we shoulder responsibility. We're a shoulder to lean on. We're standing shoulder to shoulder. We have each other's backs, even when our backs are against the wall. We're the heart of our collective health. We're not faint of heart. And our hearts are all in. We are nurses. We are the Canadian Nurses Association, and we answer the call. The first time I heard that video, it made me feel so proud to be a nurse. And at the same time, all I could think is, wow, what a great recruitment tool for the nursing profession. Yeah, I think so too. And if anything, I think it really demonstrates that, you know, nursing isn't just a job. Like in society, you have people that have jobs and they have their life. Whereas as nurses, it's kind of like you never leave your job. You might go home, but you're always a nurse, whether you're at hospital, at your job place or at home. Like the amount of times, even as a nursing student, I get calls every week from family members and friends asking questions about their health. And that's just gonna be the rest of our lives from now on. I think that's so true. You know, we we do go home and we think about our patients and did I provide good care? What could I have done differently? And and that brings forward new ideas for the next day. And it's really hard to turn it off. You make a really good point about having a hard time turning off your brain. If I think about myself in my own career over the years, I constantly question myself and I'm always reflecting on my day. Nursing is a really hard profession to just say, yeah, I'm not going to think about this because I'm done for the day. It's just not something that happens. I mean, I still carry stories and experiences I've had on the job that have forever changed my practice and my being. The other aspect of the video I liked is that it recognizes that nurses are not just in the hospital, and that ties back into our earlier conversation about the perception of nurses and where we work, when in reality, the profession is quite varied. You know, partway through the video, it mentions that healthcare is not just patient to patient, but neighborhood to neighborhood, that our health is global. And I really came to understand what that meant when I went to the ICN Congress. Healthcare concerns and nursing concerns that I have here were parallel to stories from nurses across the globe. And that leads into our theme this season for a sound constitution, which is around the sustainable development goals and how a global plan is relevant to our local community. Next, we want to mix it up a bit and share some interesting stories from nursing history. To start, we have a fast facts video from the History Channel about the world's most famous nurse, Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale was a pioneer of public health and the founder of modern nursing. Because of Florence Nightingale, nursing is one of the most regulated and respected professions in the world. Named after her city of birth, Florence, Italy, Florence Nightingale was born on May 12, 1820, into an upper-class British family. As a woman of her time and her class, it would have been expected that she would marry, maintain a lovely home, and be a hostess. But Florence Nightingale had very different plans. Though at the time nursing was not a respected profession, Nightingale felt very called to become a nurse. At age 24, Nightingale defied her parents' expectations to marry a suitable match and left England to study at the Kaiserswerth Hospital in Dusseldorf, Germany. When she returned from Germany, she took a job as a nurse at a hospital in London and she was eventually promoted after only a year to be head of nursing there. She improved sanitary conditions so much that she garnered a reputation as a reformer and as an advocate for public health. During the Crimean War, the British press made public the horrendous conditions of the wounded soldiers in Turkey. The army turned to Florence Nightingale for help. Sidney Herbert, Secretary at War, reached out directly to Nightingale. When Nightingale and her band of nurses arrived at Scutari, the hospital in the Crimea, they were shocked at what they found. The field hospitals were positioned on cesspools of putrid water. Patients were lying in their filth. More soldiers were dying from infections than they were from wounds sustained on the battlefield. Many of the reforms that Florence Nightingale instituted were quite revolutionary. Nightingale insisted that there be fresh air and water for all the soldiers, that recuperating soldiers receive healthy food to eat to help make them better, and that all of the bandages and sheets and blankets were adequately laundered each day. By the time she was done, Florence Nightingale had succeeded in reducing the death rate within these military hospitals by two-thirds. Known as the Angel of the Crimea, 
Nightingale returned to England and received a hero's welcome, a medal from Queen Victoria, and a gift of $250,000. She devoted the rest of her life to effecting change in medical care. In 1860, Florence Nightingale founded at St. Thomas Hospital in London the Nightingale Training School for Nurses. She was a pioneer in the use of cutting-edge statistical methods of the time to design hospitals and medical systems to maximize the health of the community at large. This really helped her to make her message known to the parliamentarians and government agencies who would make important decisions about hospitals and health care. In her later years, Nightingale was officially honored by Germany, France, Norway, and numerous prestigious British societies. She died at her London home on August 13, 1910. The fact that we have a nursing profession today is in large part thanks to the work of Florence Nightingale. I really love how great of a job the History Channel did on recognizing the contributions of Florence Nightingale, not just to nursing, but to healthcare in general. What did you guys think? It made me think about a few things. I went on a few stream of thoughts. One was that it's really interesting to see throughout history how women shift into the role of nursing and how that kind of came to be out of need for the community. When I was re researching for this episode, I was trying to find, because I knew we were going to talk about, you know, nurses and history and what that might look like. I came across some research on the founder of the Red Cross, Clarissa Harlow Barden, who was a teacher. Um, and she started helping out during the American Civil War in 1861 to 1865. And what she would do was she would bring supplies right onto the battlefield. And she was known as the angel of the battlefield. And that's how I started thinking about, you know, those parallels that they draw. And then also, like, how brave nurses have to be they go right onto the battlefield and I think that's still true to this day yeah I didn't know that I think you're right too Amanda by saying that you know nurses are still referred to as being on the battlefield like if you think about during the pandemic we were the frontline workers and so you know even to this day it's still considered that we're the per that we're the people right out there on the front lines doing the the work that needs to be done to support our community I think it's important to mention that through the centuries, Canadian nurses have also left lasting marks on Canadian history and Canada as a nation. In our show notes, we're going to post some links to the Grey Nuns who have been present since 1737 and the Nursing Sisters of World War I, but I want to take a moment to share the story of Nova Scotian nurse and midwife Marie Henrietta Lejeune Ross. Born in 1762, she lived to be 98 years old, something completely unheard of at the time. Granny Ross, as she was affectionately known, was a pillar of her community for many reasons. Relying on the teachings of her Mi'kmaq grandmother, she was able to combine traditional medicine with European practices when providing care. She'd often go out into the fields and forests foraging for ingredients to make teas, poultices, and other cures. But what she became famous for was her role in protecting her community from smallpox ages before the science of disease transmission was known. As smallpox started to spread in the area, she organized a tight community program which included isolating victims in a log cabin and vaccinating the healthy. It's unsure how she came to know about vaccination for smallpox, but it's believed she might have carried a serum from France or that she might have made her own by taking a scraping of pus from an infected person and transferring it into a healthy person by a scratch on her arm or shoulder. So overall, a really fascinating woman. That is just amazing, really, to think about where our everyday practices come from, even if it's just like one person can make such a huge change. And I think that's something that can motivate all of us in our everyday practice, whether we're nursing or just being that day. Here's another random nursing fact for you. Did you know that a study done in 2006 found that nurses walk on average six to eight kilometers in a 12 hour shift? Did you know there are three organizations that are important to BC nurses? There is our regulatory body, the British Columbia College of Nurses and Midwives, the union that covers most nurses in BC, the British Columbia Nurses Union, and our nursing advocacy organization, the Nurse and Nurse Practitioners of British Columbia. Welcome back to A Sound Constitution here on CHLY 101.7 FM. Just before we begin our discussion about nurses and nursing burnout, we're going to share a short clip from the BCNU's 
BC Needs More Nurses campaign. We're not heroes. I really need you in bed three. We're human. Come. And we're desperate for help. After countless months of the COVID crisis, nurses are burnt out. 35% say the pandemic has made them more likely to leave nursing in the next two years. With more nurses being forced out of the profession than ever, patient care is suffering. The situation is critical. Our healthcare system doesn't need more heroes. We need more nurses. In that video, BCNU noted that due to the experiences of the pandemic, 35% of all nurses were likely to leave the profession in the next two years. In addition, another 37% said they would likely reduce their hours after the pandemic is over. That statistic is from the Future of Nursing in British Columbia report that was conducted by the BCNU. Further key findings in that report noted that 51% of emergency and ICU nurses are more likely to leave the nursing profession in the next two years. 82% of nurses said their mental health has worsened during the pandemic, and 65% said their physical health has worsened. Furthermore, 59% say the government is not doing enough to ensure nurses are safe throughout the pandemic. The most cited issues was the ongoing staffing crisis where nurses are consistently understaffed and often have high patient assignments. Nurses voice concerns that this puts them in a position of possible unsafe conditions for the patients and themselves. Nurses also stated they felt a lack of respect from the government related to insufficient funding for health care, continued increase with nurses' licensing fees, and the inability to have unfettered access to appropriate PPE. This report reflects what we talked about earlier when it comes to nursing not being the type of profession that can just be left behind when you clock out. The effects of this pandemic and the ongoing nursing shortage, which started well before COVID, shows that nurses are experiencing moral injury and are burning out, which will directly impact the health of this community. The numbers from BCNU are not unique. Another survey of 3,676 Canadian nurses noted that 47% met the diagnostic cutoff indicative of potential PTSD. The International Council of Nurses, along with the International Centre for Nurse Migration, also released a report this January called the Sustain and Retain in 2020 and Beyond. The report outlined much of the same issues the BCNU report did. Nurses are burning out and leaving the profession due to a decrease in their mental and physical well-being. Numbers from numerous countries, including the US, the UK, Taiwan, Japan, also show the same increase in stress and burnout among their nurses. Furthermore, low- and lower-middle-income countries are facing the brunt of the global shortage due to the lower nurse graduation rates and nurse migration to higher-income countries. The report outlines numerous actions to be done at national and international levels, such as commitment to the support of safe staffing and reviewing and expanding the capacity of nursing education. Considering we are in our third year of nursing, I'm really interested. What are your thoughts on entering the nursing profession in a time like this? For me, entering the profession during a staffing crisis is quite intimidating. In the past three years, I have worked a handful of shifts as a student or employed student nurse where the nursing team was fully staffed. So all I have really known throughout my time in the nursing profession is being short-staffed. In a weird way, being short-staffed feels normal, but it's not supposed to be normal. As a student, we have that extra support and can say no to extra work. It's nerve-wracking to think that in a very short amount of time, we will be registered nurses and expected to take on and handle that massive patient assignment. However, even with the staffing crisis, I still am motivated to become a nurse because I want it more than I fear it. I want to be able to help alleviate the nursing shortage. I want to provide exceptional care. But overall, I hope that eventually this will all be possible with the right amount of staff. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where even when we are not at work, we're not standing around, we're still thinking about it. And I really appreciated uh, what you said earlier about how we are normalizing things that shouldn't be normal to us. It's not normal to have care of eight to 10 patients instead of, you know, the the four to five patients that we should be caring for. And it's really stressful, I think, because in order for us to provide good quality care, which is always the intention, we ourselves have to be healthy, but we're being asked to meet unhealthy expectations.
And I think also just the mental aspect of it, of being students and saying, like, seeing and hearing that this is what we're going to be going into in about a year and already hearing how many new grads are burning out just because you know you're brand new at this job and you're expected to do all these things and you have supports but that's not enough with the amount of patients you're giving right now. I think it is important to have this discussion as nursing students because the nursing shortage is going to get worse based off of the current estimates and there is no single answer or quick way to fix it. We will graduate feeling the professional effects of the pandemic. Yet, I want to point out, each of us are still here, as are thousands of nursing students across the country. In that way, I find it heartening because despite the statistics and witnessing a lot of hardships, I see it create so much resolve in my classmates. You know, I've been nursing for 10 years and have seen so many changes up close. Sometimes it's been really tough, especially the last two years, but I know for myself, it has just made me that much more determined to graduate and work towards my goals in policy and nursing advocacy. But I'm very curious, what is it for all of you? What is it that motivates you to push forward? Is it the desire to help or the fact that most of us nursing students are exceptionally stubborn, high achievers and refuse to quit? Or is it something more profound like, you know, taking on the difficult, being in that difficult? What keeps you going forward? You know, I think a lot of us came into nursing because we're caring people and we believe in empathy. And I think that's what motivates us to still go into this field. Even though we know it is short staffed, it is stressful, you're going to be taking it home with you, there is a high level of burnout. It's, you know, the benefits of it all, of being able to provide care for vulnerable vulnerable populations and help people, it outweighs the potential of the negativity that could come with it. In the video, they talked about nurses not being heroes, we're humans. And as humans, we are coming with our own experiences and understandings of the world. Um, And so I think what motivates me is, you know, I see that there's a need that needs to be filled. And I know from my own experiences what it's like when you're not able to fill those needs. And I just want to step up to the plate and be able to support my community and providing better healthcare practices that is going to enhance the well-being of each and every one of us. Personally, I can't really see myself in another profession. As nursing students, we're, we get to go to the hospitals and learn and provide care for our patients. And the more we do that, the more I'm becoming more excited to be able to do more for the patients. But I am actually quite nervous and scared about burnout. It's quite sad because we want to do more for these patients. It's just physically limiting. There's not enough time and nurses every day advocate for their patients, but nurses are struggling as well. And so the public has to advocate for the nurses. I would like to address that point, Haven, because I know a lot of people wonder what can they do? The last two years has really shone a light into the current nursing shortage and the ramifications that has on health. And that has led to countless British Columbians to stand up every day and say, I see you. You know, I saw the signs, the banging of the pots, the shared social media posts. All of that is part of this message being sent that nurses are important to the health and well-being of our citizens. We as nurses share a close partnership with our communities in improving health care for all. I just wanted to add on top of that as well. Um, I was reviewing the ICN, the International Council of Nursing, nursing report that you brought up earlier, Dana, and putting aside burnout and, you know, nurses leaving because of the pandemic, they are expecting one out of six nurses globally to retire in the next 10 years. And they estimate that it's 4.7 million new nurses have to be educated and employed just to replace those who retire. So that's like another factor. So pre-pandemic, there was already like a a shortage and estimated like further shortage as well. As nursing students, I think if we were to, you know, not go forward with finishing school or whatever, it's going to happen anyway. So we might as well be part of the solution. So I think that's sort of where I come from. It's like the more nurses we get out there educated, employed, like the better it's going to be. So we might as well be a part of that. Yep. That also has to do with governments as well. Like, Mm -hmm. to get more seats at these nursing schools, 
the governments have to actually allow for that. We only have 72 seats here at VIU for nursing students, Bachelor of Science in Nursing program. That's a small portion. I feel like that needs to become more. Yeah, we need more. We need more seats available so we can get more nursing students in order to get more nurses. If you think about it, on the island, there are four schools that offer the Bachelor of Science in Nursing program. And so if there's only four and not all of them have 72 seats, and then you think about the population of Vancouver Island and how many applicants every school is getting, it's minuscule how many nurses are actually graduating and becoming registered RNs. Yeah, and not all 72 have made it. Like, exactly. there are students who drop out or move to a different program. You know, it's really funny that you guys mentioned the issues with entrance into the nursing program. It took me about five years to actually get into this nursing program. And the first time I applied, it was understandable that I needed to upgrade some of my course requisites. But the other four years that I was applying had nothing to it. My grades had nothing to do with it. It was honestly, there were there were not enough seats for students and we were competing against each other for these seats. And I remember I wrote numerous letters to the program chair begging for them to open up more seats in, in the program so that I could attend and that other people could attend because there's a need. It didn't make sense to me why they wouldn't just do that. And I remember one of the responses that I was given was simply that, you know, it's really about funding and they're not receiving enough funding to open up those seats. And, and what can we do? Our hands are tied. It was certainly a frustrating conversation to have. Thank you all for your thoughts and thank you, Taylor, for giving context to the nursing shortage before the pandemic exasperated it. To give some numbers around that, a 2019 BC labor market outlook estimated that BC needed 24,000 nurses by 2029 to appropriately staff our healthcare system. So we knew that as baby boomers retired, we were going to see a shift in our workforce. And then we were also going to see an increase with our older adult population and those who need more healthcare support. The ICN report noted that the global shortage of nurses was estimated to be about 5.9 million. If just 4% of the global nursing workforce decides to leave, it could push that shortage to over 7 million. As we've discussed here and mentioned in both reports, a key factor in offsetting the losses is to increase seats in nursing education programs. I have heard the rhetoric of, well, why can't universities and colleges just increase their seating? Well, because it costs a lot of money. The same goes for LPN to RN bridging programs. When I came back from my RN, I actually had to start in year one. And the reason was there was no bridging programs on the island at the time due to a few factors, including cost of the program. So for the four years I've been in this program, I've only worked as a casual LPN and picked up more hours over the summer. That means my employer is missing an experienced LPN for four years, but doesn't gain a new RN for that time frame either. Now, I know we are starting to see changes in funding of seats and more bridging programs, but that leads to a second major problem, and that's the shortage of nursing instructors. We cannot fill new seats if we do not have the instructors and the support staff in place to provide those students the education they need. Nursing school is intense. It's hard, it's heavy, and it needs knowledgeable and experienced nursing educators to take on that load. We're really lucky at VIU to have the amazing nursing instructors that we do who have stepped up to give us a great education, but I really start to wonder what is their stress and their concerns going to look like when they're trying to balance the need for more students and the time and ability that they need to manage larger course loads. There is a real risk of burnout there too. And with that, we're just going to take a short break before we round out the rest of our discussion on how we self-care. You've been telling yourself you want to live healthier, but you have no idea where to start. The good news is that you don't have to spend thousands of dollars on a private chef and personal trainer to live a healthier lifestyle. It starts with just a few little changes that you build upon day after day. 
Sure, there are guys named Fabrice who charge a thousand English pounds per hour to whip your body into shape while wearing spandex. But you can also just go for a 30-minute walk every day to lower your stress, reduce the amount of cortisol being dumped into your blood, and even help you to lose weight. If you walk outside, the benefits are compounded. Experts who've gone to prestigious universities have studied the effects of being outdoors and learned it makes us happier, more cooperative, smarter, and retain our memories better. Two, you could also fork over some major cash to have a highly trained nutritionist tell you what not to eat. Or you could just make some silly simple changes, like giving up one junk food a week while replacing it with something better, like leafy greens, vegetables, fresh fruits, nuts, seeds, sprouts, and healthy oils. If you did this every week, by the end of a single year, you would have completely transformed your diet. One of the biggest components to our overall health is mental health. We're quick to ditch the sugar if we need to squeeze into a dress for a special event. But how much do we take our daily happiness into account? What if you could feel like a million bucks every day by simply altering neurochemicals in your brain? It's not hard to do this. Simply increase foods and lifestyle choices that create natural happiness hormones like dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. That means you can eat dark chocolate, laugh as often as possible, and add probiotics to your gut to feel like every day is a good day. I recognize a lot of the conversation today has been a mix of lighter discussion around what it means to be a nurse and what calls us to this profession, along with heavier discussion about the nursing shortage and the real risk of burnout. In light of this, I ask you, how do you self-care? I would love to speak to this. Like I was saying at the beginning of the episode, I worked as a mental health care worker for a long period of time. I actually stopped working in the mental health care field because of burnout. I experienced um, some very traumatizing things and it really put a lot of stress on me. And that was a learning experience because I burnt out and now I'm in this new career where the truth is I could burn out again. And one of the things I learned from my past experiences is that it's really important for you to be able to set firm boundaries around what is reasonable for you to do at work and what is not. And I think we need to start to learn to say no and be okay with that. Boundaries are very, very important. And I think it's a big part of self-care that we ignore. Um, so learning to say no and learning to set more reasonable expectations on ourselves, And that's really what I do to self-care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's advocating for yourself and standing up for yourself. Yeah, I think learning to say no is something that's very difficult for a lot of people to do. And it's also very important. And I think honestly, just in terms of self-care, find something you love and make time for it. No excuses. You make time for it. If you've had a long day, if you haven't had a long day, you schedule it into your schedule. Like something I do is I love to go to the gym and I love to work out. And that's just every day. I don't care if I have a big schedule or not. I will go and I'll make time for at least an hour to just go and do it because I know that if I don't do it, I'm not going to have a good day. So that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Something I do is I, I don't do like homework or anything on Friday night. It's like, that's like my night where I don't do anything. And even if I have like so many things to do, I'm like, oh, it's Friday. <laughs> and then I get excited. Like I don't do anything on Friday night. And I think it's just sort of like that little break there in my own time. Mm -hmm. That's a nice idea, actually. I like that. I actually love reading, so that's what I do. Kind of escape reality. What do books do for you? It de-stresses me. <laughs> well, I like what you were saying about, you know, when you read a book, you know, being taken to this other world. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of lets you move away from the reality and the stresses that you're living in that moment. And what a gift is that? Nice. <laughs> Nicely said. <laughs> I also like, this might sound weird, but if I'm making dinner, I like put on a podcast that I'm interested in because then I don't have to listen to anything else around me. I make my dinner and I listen to a podcast and it's distracting and you kind of take that time where you have to get something done, but you're also doing something for yourself, right? Oh yeah, I do a similar thing as well. I have like this comfort show 
the good place <laughs> i've watched that i swear like four or five times like the whole thing <laughs> for me it's scrubs i have watched that entire series except season nine because we don't acknowledge season nine but i've watched it four or five times now at least it's the perfect blend of humor and empathy, and I have always loved how one of its main characters was this strong, fierce nurse. To me, she was one of the first nurses on TV I ever remember seeing that wasn't a background character. So I will always go back to watching the series or watching an episode in the series when I just need some time to unwind and I need to self-care. And that brings us to the end of our conversation today. I would like to thank my amazing co-hosts and teammates for being present to share a bit about themselves and have a discussion with me about nursing and some of the challenges we face as a profession today. I'd like to thank our listeners for joining us on our first episode, and I really hope you join us next week as we all sit down together again and talk about our theme for this season, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We understand that a lot of people may not know what these goals are or have a misunderstanding about their purpose. So we want to talk about how these goals came to be, what they are, and how these global goals have actual meaning to health and wellness of where we live and work. So it's going to be a lot of great conversation. We've got some interviews with members of our community who really focus on these goals, and I'm looking forward to learning more about them along with what we have planned for future episodes. For details and show notes from today's episode, or to follow along on what's coming up this season, check out our Facebook page at A Sound Constitution and our Instagram, C-H-L-Y, A Sound Constitution. If you've missed parts of this episode or would like to listen to this episode or episodes from our past shows, check out our YouTube at A Sound Constitution. 